uh, open edX and the learnings that we are getting uh, by making it one of the largest open source platform of the world. So rather than taking any particular case study, I will use the experience that we have got while, while working with so many governments around the world and give you a summary of what makes open edX one of the largest platform of the world. So I'm Amit Goyal, I head edX for uh, India and Southeast Asia. I've been with edX for about three and a half years. Uh, I'm an educationist. I used to head uh, education for Samsung India earlier. And uh, I've had good experience working with governments. I used to head uh, Akash tablet project, which is a one laptop per child project by government of India, uh, wherein I was instrumental in making the cheapest tablet PC for the world, uh, because accessibility was one of the major challenge a few years ago thanks to uh, smart devices and lower smartphones available now. Uh, so what's edX? Uh, does this picture gives you any idea on what we are trying to do? Do you know what is this? These are Lego blocks, right? Now, what is the connection between Lego blocks and education? Is it okay now? Okay. <laughs> so what is the connection of Lego blocks and education? I'm going to share in the next 30 minutes now. 30 minutes, right? OK. I'll try to be quick. So this is a very learned audience. You all know a lot about education. You all know a lot about MOOCs. Just coming on uh, how world around us is transforming. So the transportation business is completely overhauled by technology. Earlier, we used to be on the mercy of taxi drivers. They could charge whatever tariff that they want from us. And now what do we use? Grab or Uber, wherein we have complete mobility with us. Same has gone for entertainment. We have Netflix. We have entertainment at our own hand. For hotel industry, even if you have a small house, you could become an hotelier. You could convert your hotel into an Airbnb and move ahead. This is how our classrooms used to look about 50, 60 years ago. And fortunately or unfortunately, this is how a lot of our classrooms still look like today. The education still seems to be very rudimentary, wherein the professor comes, speaks in a classroom, attended by a class of 60 to 70 students maximum, scalability remains a major challenge. However, the learned audience which is present over here who are doing some significant work on MOOCs is transforming this into something unique. Now I'll tell you a story about edX. How many of you are familiar with edX over here? OK. How many of you have taken a course on edX? <laughs> OK. Well, that's, that's still a good number. <laughs> so what is edX? edX is a joint venture of MIT and Harvard University. It was started by the professor Anant Agarwal, who used to head the Department of Computer Science at MIT for the last 25 years. And in the year 2011, 2012, he felt that a lot of his students are doing some great work in education. Have you heard of Khan Academy? Khan Academy is one of the most popular K-12 learning platform, which was founded by one of his students. And he thought at MIT, which is the, one of the most prestigious engineering institute in the world, they claim themselves to be offering the finest quality engineering education. But it is going away from the fundamental of education. Education has to be for everyone. But when we talk about Ivy League universities, do you think everyone can get admission into Oxford and MIT and Harvard of the world? It is only accessible to a handful of people. Only the privileged ones who have some reference, who are very meritorious, who have good financial background, they are able to get admission into those Ivy League universities. On the other hand, education by its very fundamental nature should be as ubiquitous, as oxygen, the air we breathe in. It's like I have a pond of good water but I'm saying only the privileged ones are able to drink from it, not the other ones. So with that notion in mind, he said, whatever I'm teaching at MIT, I'm going to put that online. And I'm going to see how the world responds to it. So he started his first course in circuits and electronics. That was a three months long course. What he saw after the end of three months is 155,000 students from all over the world took his course, 192 countries. Some students completed 5%, some completed 10%, some completed 20%. But about 9,000 students actually passed the entire course. 
they took the same assessment, the same examination, which a non-campus student would do. And that made him realize it will take him at least 40 years to teach 9,000 students at MIT campus. That's when MIT got interested and they said, okay, we will now call it MIT X. But then Howard came along. Howard said, this is brilliant. We want to be a part of it. So now you just can't call it MIT X. It has to be an equal partnership. That led us into thinking, what do we call it? So we named it edX. X could be anything. Education, wherein the possibilities could be endless. That is what edX is. It is a joint venture of MIT and Harvard University. It is the world's largest non-profit MOOC platform. Today, we have 100, we have 2,600 plus courses from 140 plus top ranking institutes of the world. An organization has to become an edX member in order to put their courses on edX platform. The membership is granted on the basis of the reputation's name, their commitment, and their alignment to edX's vision. As I said, we have 140 plus of the top ranking institutes and the professional bodies as an edX member. The MIT, Harvard, Oxford, Berkeley, Columbia, Michigan, we also have some professional organizations like Microsoft, IBM, Linux, Amazon, who are an edX member and they put their courses on this MOOC platform. Most of the courses, or I would rather say all of the courses on edX, except a very handful few, we have about 2,600 plus online courses. All of the courses can be taken on edX platform absolutely free. As a MOOC platform, we are committed to providing access to high quality education. Any idea when e-learning started? What was the year when e-learning started? We have been hearing e-learning for a very, very long time. So e-learning started somewhere around end of 90s. It used to be multimedia videos, flash-based animations, and then some professors decided, we want to go into online education. So what they simply used to do is, they will teach a normal class, and they will put a camera somewhere in the class, they will record the entire lecture, they will put it online, or put it on pen drive, and they say, this is a e-learning class. But that was not an e-learning class. That was definitely not a MOOC. Because if you're teaching in classroom versus if you're creating an online course, your audience could be entirely different. The way you are teaching could be entirely different. So we have used all those neurosciences and learners' data at scale to tell you what goes into this finest MOOC platform. So the university create their courses on edX platform. They get complete training and support on how to create an edX course. All of the university and the members have to follow a common pedagogy for launching this online course. As you can see over here, the price for learning is absolutely free, which means anyone who wants to learn from the top institute of the world can just go to edX.org, take a course of their choice, and start learning absolutely free because we are committed to providing access to high quality education. How do we sustain ourselves? We give the learner a choice to get a certificate of completion. The certificate of completion and graded assessment is a part of paid certification. On an average, they pay about $100 to get a certificate from a top university of the world to demonstrate that they have this tangible learning, that they have completed this course online. Now, edX uses an active learning pedagogy. This is how the format of an edX course. The average duration of an edX course, and this is what we communicate to all our university partners, should be about six to eight weeks long. If you want to teach something longer, if you think you will not be able to teach something in six to eight weeks, you may break down into multiple courses. On edX, each course is about three to four hours long per week, which means a learner is supposed to study for about three to four hours. By the way, this is an interactive session. Uh, if you have any question in between, feel free to ask that as well. So edX course anatomy is about six weeks long. Every week a learner studies for three to four hours. In this three to four hours of learning, the content is mainly delivered in the form of pre-recorded video lectures. How long a video should be? Many of you may have an idea about it. Someone say six, seven. Yes. So about seven minutes should be the ideal duration of an edX course or any online training material. Sorry, my, net, my slides are going a bit slow. 
So what we did was we literally put EEG machines on learners' brain and see if they are watching an academic video. After what time will they start getting bored? After what time will their attention span decrease? So we realized that after six minutes, their attention span started decreasing. So we told all our university partners that the videos should be about six to seven minutes long in duration. So these are bite-sized learning components. The next thing that you need to do is to have an active learning system because there is no point that someone is just watching a video and they're not interacting with the content. Because what happens is today when a professor goes to a class, they would want to teach 100%. He's able to explain 75% and students are able to retain less than 50% because the engagement is not there, the interaction is not there. So what we have done on edX is we realize that if you include videos with discussions and interpolated testing and give everything assembled, your learning results are going to be 27% more effective. That's why on edX, if you start a course, you will watch a video. After watching a video, there would be an assessment or a knowledge test, and there would be a discussion. That overall increases your learning retention. Statistics says it is about 27% more effective. We have about 21 million learners around the world, just on edX platform. What we have done is we have compiled the big data from these learners and the neuroscience, the science of learning, amalgamated them both and see what comes up. One of the learning that we got is active learning is 27% more effective. How long a video should be? It should be about six to seven minutes long. The EEG data that we saw, you see the blue dots in the last one, the blue images, that's a red flag. It means the video wasn't effective at that stage. He was not able to explain the concept very well. So he can, do, he can go back to this particular point, revisit he was trying to explain, and use some other medium. If I'm not able to explain you something through this lecture, I may replace that with a case study, or I may replace that with an assessment, and then see if you're able to move forward. That is why on edX platform, the courses have a different pace. Some courses are self-paced, which means that they can run for a longer duration. You do not need to update the content. A lot of communication skills courses could fall into that segment. A lot of business and management courses could come into that segment. But the technology courses, especially the emerging technologies one, we run them on specific intervals. For example, if we are offering a course on future cities or let's say internet of things or machine learning or artificial intelligence, technology is changing so rapidly, I cannot run a course today and leave it intact for a year because technology would go to another level. So our professors will run it for two months, three months. After that, they will go to the Canvas board, see the learner's analytics, the learner's insight, make changes to their course content, and then rerun. This makes sure that the content is always refreshed. They also get the student's perspective. Now, one of the question about MOOCs is, and I'm sure you will get this question all the time, which is more effective, a classroom training or an online course? I would say both have their own merits and demerits. The opportunities when we are talking about online education is the scale. The limitation is how does a learner and professor, they talk to each other. So, I mean, one thing is very common. Whenever someone takes an, you know, a classroom-based course and a professor is trying to teach them something, students will not really raise their hand in the middle of a lecture and clear their doubts or queries. They will actually jot down the point discuss it with their peers, and once the lecture is over, they will discuss it with their friends or with the professors. So we have taken the same pedagogy online. So when you design an online course, make sure you make, give a chance to the learner to interact with the content. So we have put in discussion forums, which is like the Facebook of learning. So at any given point of time, in any course, if a learner is having any query, any doubt, any question, they can denote it onto that particular point and raise a question. Most likely that question would already be answered. If it is not answered, then within seven minutes, a learner who's taking the same course anywhere else in the world will reply to that query. Or professor, or the course team. What we have also done is we have implemented smart AI technology, wherein let's say if I have asked a question in the discussion forum, 
and my friend sitting there he gives a wrong answer the machines are going to predict they will pick up the keywords they will try and make a sense whether the explanation is right or wrong if the explanation is wrong a message will go to the professor and professor will then or someone from the course team will then give the right answer the average response time on edx platform is 7 minutes to get a response we also get to know how interesting was the video again we are using ai and ml and the neurosciences to check the learner's p value and we have said that interpolated testing actually gives 27% times more effective results what are moocs also trying to do is they actually innovate on the quality of learning this is not just recording a video lecture and putting it online there are very rich problem types for example what we have also done is when someone is taking a course online they have to interact with a peer i was taking a course from world bank and i have to enter a subjective answer multiple choice questions can be answered by machines they can verify this is right or wrong but if i have to write an essay type answer which is must for many of the business related courses how does a machine check it if i ask a professor to check it it will not become scalable because i mean a professor cannot literally check thousands and millions of responses so we have put in a component of peer grading the system automatically checks your learning level assign an individual who is at the same learning level as you whatever you respond will be checked by another peer and they will respond to it similarly you will have to check their papers as well there are very rich student analytics that i showed you which tells you how active they were were there so many questions what are they asking in the discussion forums etc then there are teams and group projects a learner can work in a team or i can assign a team make a virtual team and then learn in that group there are different assessments it could be numeric formula drag and drop if i'm trying to explain a physics diagram circuits i can draw capacitors and resistors pass current through it so it gives a gamification feeling learners interact with the content and there are images so we use machine learning over here what moocs also do is they innovate on learners integrity so especially when we are dealing with top universities of the world they want to make sure that students genuinely earn their certificate they just don't buy it they don't want the learners to trick or cheat the system so there are many options some of the exams could be timed controlled randomized set of problems could be given there could be adaptive assessment for example the system will check what is the learning level of a particular learner and the questions will be thrown as per their learning level as they become comfortable with the content with the study material the levels will increase there is virtual proctored exams so for example many of the courses on edx are credit backed which means universities will give you their credits for taking those courses and universities can't give you their credit just like that so there are virtual proctored element wherein proctoring tools are deployed learners have to sit in front of webcam the machine makes sure that the learner is not cheating the system there is ab testing so for example if you feel this is group a this is group b i can get different set of questions to this group different set of questions to this group i can use the same with my learning methodology as well and all of you for example this group will learn through videos this group will learn the same concept through a case study or through an assessment or through a knowledge test and eventually both of you will take the same assessment so what i'm trying to do as a professor when i'm going to class i will use a simple style a single style to teach a concept but through online moocs i can change my pedagogy i can use videos or i can use other mediums i can use a testing and b testing and have the learner take the same assessment and then get their logs when we talk about education it has to be inclusive education edx is also one of the world's most accessible platform this is a learner from india bhargav we got his learner story last year unfortunately he is fully blind but he has great interest in education he used a special reading device took a course in python from mit completed that with 93% marks and today he is working with a large multinational company in bangalore so this is the kind of learner stories that we are able to get 
getting access to high quality education in developing countries is very difficult that is where these moocs come in handy i was talking to my friend about uh, the campus placement or the recruitment days in india 80% of the engineers are considered unemployable because the kind of education that they are getting from from campus it's obsolete it is not good enough for corporates to make the learner work ready so what can those students do those students while taking their classes they can take these online courses and earn a skill set and edx is full of all such learner stories a lot of edx learners the impact that we have today is about 21 million learners 2600 plus courses 140 plus global partners and these many enrollments and we have achieved it all within 6 years so about 2021 million is there on edx platform we have the same set through open edx many of you are using open edx so edx is the only organization which has actually given away their crown jewel for example would you ask google if they give away their search algorithm that's their bread and butter we have invested a lot of time energy money and resources to create this world class platform and what is the significant way to move forward rather than keeping everything to ourselves as the nature of education is to give what we have done is we have given away access to education what we have also done is we have given away the entire platform absolutely free which means today if anyone wants to use a mooc platform they can simply download the source code from open edx and have a platform as rich as edx or even better with their own innovation so a lot of nations around the world are using open edx as a national learning platform for china we have shutang x any of you is familiar with shutang which is a national learning platform for china which is powered by open edx similarly the national learning platform for france russia jordan japan israel korea saudi arabia afghanistan these are running on open edx platform we are also open to working with each one of you if you want to get some information on how open edx can be used in your organization we do not monetize it it is widely accessible just go to open edx and you will be able to get all the information we have a network of uh, system integrators if you do not have the technology resources in house but you want to use a platform then don't pay millions of dollars to get a proprietary platform take the world class platform absolutely free put your own courses put your own certificate and for all of this you have to pay a significant amount of money to edx any idea how much money do you have to pay to edx to get this zero no strings attached there is no terms and condition it is literally zero just go online download it start using white label it use your own courses use your own certification use your own servers just get the finest material from edx we have discovered about 1800 plus websites around the world are running on open edx so with open edx we have about additional 21 million learners around the world that makes edx the single largest learning platform of the world edx plus open edx has the largest reach around the world okay so i'll be quick within this presentation i'm actually summarizing the kind of learning that we are getting at scale not from a single case study but from overall because this may be of valuable to all of you sitting over here so this is a era of artificial intelligence and machine learning things around us are changing very rapidly i'll skip this so do you know what is this do you see this in thailand so this is an automatic kiosk i saw in boston so at mcdonalds all the customer facing staff is on verge of depletion they say automation is going to take away our jobs but this is really happening now it is happening while we are talking the front line people are losing their jobs to machines because they are more operational they are more efficient for businesses so for example rather than placing an order to someone on the counter i can go online place my entire order on this machine this will directly go to the kitchen and this eliminates at least 5 people on the front desk now imagine what automation is doing to us 
growing economies like india and china foxconn which is one of the major supplier for for china their 60000 factory workers were replaced by robots and these robots were expensive so gone are the days when world will look to developing countries just for cheap labor because it's not just the cheap labor which is required in future it's the efficiency and efficiency is coming from latest technologies this image really scares us we work with a number of institutes a number of governments and everyone says robots are going to take away our jobs people will lose their jobs to robots do you know what percentage of the jobs will be changed in the next 10 years 50% of the jobs that exist today will not be there in 2030 and these are the searches these are the descriptions given from the top institutes 50% of the jobs which are there will not be there so imagine we are sitting over here the next time you shake a hand in 2030 the same person might not be there this is a bit scary but the work has always changed hasn't it earlier we used to work on those big crt based tvs that evolved into leds now that evolved into smartphones and now the input is completely changing does anyone here use alexa right so alexa is a very interactive voice assistant my mom she didn't go to school and she takes care of my daughter when me and my wife are at work and she says she loves to watch cartoon but i cannot go to youtube and write that and play this so last week i gave her alexa and she is on cloud 9 every day she is like alexa good morning play me this song and my child starts dancing and she eats her food so my mom says this has changed her life so input and output has changed significantly how does it translates to what we are doing today today mooc courses are not just offered to academic students corporates governments working professionals they are the beneficiary of this online learning what is the limitation of learning today it is very expensive it is not able to cope up with a changing technology education in the university is highly bundled what is the average duration of a bachelor's degree in thailand average duration of a bachelor's degree in thailand 3 years 4 years masters 2 years now imagine we are talking about cryptocurrencies someone who wants to make a career in cryptocurrency he goes to a bachelor's degree graduates after 4 years after 4 years do you think cryptocurrencies will remain the same way <laughs> dinosaurs would have taken it away so we have been offering bundled education for a very very long time this must changed uber has taken away transport same has happened with education and entertainment so this needs to work as well the learning for tomorrow and this forms the basis for moocs it has to be connected it has to be personalized on demand in demand anywhere anywhere that you want when you are working on national level mooc platforms there are some opportunities that exist for you the opportunities that you see is the scale you are able to teach students across the entire nation at a scale diversity you are able to cater to the learning requirements of a large different varied set of people and the impact you are able to get the learners data of their lifelong learning these are the opportunities that lie ahead of you when you're working on a national level mooc platform what are the challenges the challenges are while scale is an opportunity it is also a challenge when you're working on a national level mooc platform creativity and change management remains a major challenge because you're working with nation you're working with government pardon me for saying this but government is often a giant elephant very difficult to move they just don't change they will stick to the old concepts just like traditional universities so that is where moocs face some challenges and again catering to personalized learning requirements remains a major issue so moocs are going to change that significantly overall what are the three trends that we are seeing while working with edx while working with other national level mooc platforms some of this learning also comes from future skills platform anyone here aware of skills future platform by singapore government so singapore government is heavily focused on imparting high quality education to their learners they have something called skills credit skills wallet 
every Singapore adult citizen gets about 500 US, 500 Singapore dollars to upskill themselves. The government knows that if their workforce has to remain relevant for tomorrow, they have to acquire new skills. Otherwise, they will just be replicated. So they have created a national level platform called Future Skills. On Future Skills, different content providers and universities can become a member, put their courses. Any Singaporean adult citizen can go there, maybe take a course from edX. Let's say if it is $100, $200, they will complete it, get the certificate, show that certificate to the government, and government is going to reimburse that money, which is 400 US dollar, which is a significant amount. So that is a level of commitment that the government gives while launching such platforms. The three trends that we see in education, which is very important, very significant, especially for all of you, as a takeaway, which is a crux of what we have learned in the next, in the last six years. Modular education, omni-channel education, and lifelong learning. What is modular education? You just told me. The bachelor's degree is four years. The master's degree is two years. Do you remember when was it last changed? A bachelor's degree has always been three to four years, as far as I can remember. A master's degree has always been two years, as far as I can remember, or one year. But in the changing world, wherein every pattern is changing, we cannot have the same bundled education. So what edX has launched is they have launched learning pathways. Remember the Lego that I showed you on the first screen? Education is getting stacked. So rather than taking a fully bundled two years or a four years degree, you can take a semester online. We have called it MicroMasters. What is a MicroMasters? You want to learn a master's degree, you actually get a taste of master's degree once you get on campus, once you start learning it. Let's say I am a BTEC, I am an engineer, and all of my friends around are taking an MBA. And I would follow the fashion and I will take an MBA as well. But after getting into the MBA, I will realize this is not meant for me. But by that time, it is too late. So how do I get a taste of what I want to do without actually getting into it? This is something which is missing from our education system. So this MicroMasters, if you are a working professional, if you are a student, if you are doing your bachelor's degree, or what, if you are in high school, you can just go online, take a MicroMasters. We have 50 plus MicroMasters in emerging areas, business management, entrepreneurship, whatever you can think of. A MicroMasters is like a master's level semester that you do online. How many courses does a semester usually has? About four to eight courses. Similarly, in the MicroMasters also, you have four to eight courses. If you just want to take one course, just take one course and be done with it. You will get one course certificate. If you want to take the entire MicroMasters, take all the courses at your convenience, and then you will get a MicroMaster certificate from the university. What is the benefit of that MicroMasters? You can stack it. For example, Georgia Tech, which is one of the top 10 universities of the world in mathematics, offer a fully online master's degree under 10,000 US dollars, significantly cheap. And the certificate is exact copy of an on-campus degree. You can get it in under $10,000. If you don't want to go for an entire master's degree, take a micro master's, which is equal to one semester. You don't want to take one semester, just take a single course. That's it. So you can stack your degrees, you can stack your credential. Moving forward, gone would be the days when you will have to study one degree at one campus only. I will be able to take one semester from Columbia, another uh, semester from Bangkok University, and maybe Oxford University is going to give me an entire degree. So this is where the future is headed. Education is getting modular. What are the statistics that we see from edX and open edX? 91% of the learners using these MOOCs, they report career outcomes, positive career outcomes. As I said, we have also launched fully online master's degree. These universities are offering fully online master's degree. When you're launching your own MOOC platforms, you would be mindful or at any given point of time, you would be asked to deliver fully online master's degree. We are working with Jordan X. In Jordan, for a very long time, there were issues about the gender inequality. Women were not allowed to drive. So how do they go to universities and study? 
government created their national MOOC platform. And they invited their top universities to come, contribute, offer their online degrees. So anyone sitting anywhere would be able to acquire a degree from a top university. While giving a degree, learner's integrity is a major challenge. How are we solving it? Through proctored exams. So learners cannot cheat the system. For every MicroMasters, there are capstone projects. So you get hands-on experience. For example, if someone is offering a MicroMasters or a program in mobile application development, other than just academic course, at the end of it, you will get a capstone project wherein you have to create a mobile application, put it on Google Play, and monetize it. Omnichannel education. You guys are classic example of omnichannel education. Just like retail, which is going online, similarly, universities are also looking for multiple channels. And MOOCs are a perfect example. A college will offer their own campus degree. They will offer their executive programs. They will also offer their MOOCs, MOOCs courses on your channel. I'll play a short video of how edX is working with universities and offering an integrated program. A large number of students around the world don't really have access to high quality education from a university such as Harvard and MIT. Even if you're smart enough, it's still very hard to afford it. Disappointed? Don't be. Five more minutes. Imagine being admitted in a local affordable university while getting certified courses with top notch universities like Harvard and MIT. Sounds good? Information Technology University Punjab is going to become the first digital university in Pakistan and one of the first universities in the world to integrate micro master certification programs offered by edX into universities accredited degree programs. edX founded by MIT and Harvard University is a massive online open course provider which has reached over 1 billion people across the globe. Online learning is revolutionizing the world. Education will never be the same again, and edX is at the cutting edge of this revolution. edX consists of weekly learning sequences. Each learning sequence is composed of short videos interspersed with interactive learning exercises, where students can immediately practice the concepts from the videos. The courses often include tutorial videos that are similar to small on-campus discussion groups, an online textbook, and an online discussion forum where students can post and review questions and comments to each other and teaching assistants. Where applicable, online laboratories are incorporated into the course. This revolutionary online platform is now becoming a part of Information Technology University Punjab. Through this unique partnership, we are bringing the top courses from the best universities in US on the edX platform to classrooms in Pakistan, where students will be able to take courses from top universities such as Harvard and MIT and get a degree from ITU, which is a government chartered university in Pakistan. So when we work with these universities, uh, sometimes teachers are afraid. I've worked with government for a very long time and what we see is, when you go and try and tell them to go digital, they will say, are the machines going to replace a teacher? And we say, if a teacher can be replaced by a machine, he or she should be, right? Teachers, machines are not here to replace them. Machines are here to make them more effective. What we see is, we use blended learning approach while working with them. So while you're developing your own MOOC platform, keep a room for encouraging blended learning. Online learning, the states are still persistent. So I'll very quickly summarize the last point. It is about lifelong learning. So your MOOCs courses or the courses that you design will not be just for academic students, but the technology is so rapidly changing, whatever you're catering will be used by a global audience today from seven to 96 years old. So that's all. Thank you for having me today. I'm open to any questions that you might be having. Thank you.
So do you have any questions? Please feel free. We want to make it an interactive session. Doesn't matter how a question would be, any basic, whatever it would be. It will open room for discussion, please. And others may learn from it. Yes, sir. Yes, I just uh, would like to clarify the uh, idea of omnichannel education. So in Punjab University, um, in the video, the idea was that um, students would have to take edX courses as part of their degree. Um, so, so basically, when you're enrolled in that program, they say maybe you need to pass like three or four edX courses as part of their degree. That is correct. Right. So that's the concept. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So we are talking about integrated degrees because uh, every country will have top universities, very good quality universities, and every country will have not so elite or poorer universities. So how do we bridge the digital gap? How do we bring them all into the same level? And this is something that the national MOOC platforms can actually do. The top university in a country can actually create their courses. They can put that onto a national MOOC platform. And teachers will take reference from that online course, which is created by a top university professor, ask their students to complete that course on the MOOC platform. And they can act as a guide student will take that course online, come back to the classroom, discuss the case studies, discuss the problem with their teachers, and that's how student will pass the course. Once they pass all the courses, they will get the credits which is required for them to complete the courses online. So it's like a university can actually hire professors from top universities of the world virtually and offer an integrated degree. Yes, but the, uh, the, sorry, the course itself is the, just a regular edX course that is available on the edX site, right? It's not like a special course that they no, collaborated. It is, it is not a custom course. Okay. It is a regular course. Okay. And universities decide their own learning pathway. Mm -hmm. For example, they could, while they're teaching artificial intelligence, they may also pick soft skills. So edX also has a consortium of corporate advisory board. Because when we talk about education, I think from a university perspective, we have moved away from the business of education. We're actually now getting into the business of employment. When a student joins a university, they don't get an admission there because he would want to learn from there. But his main motivational factor is, if I get a certificate from this university, my employability question becomes like this. So the first factor that they look for is the employability perspective. And this is what the universities also have to cater to. So they can have a mix. So as I said, edX has a corporate advisory board, which comprises of the top CLOs from large organizations like Boeing, Amazon, Google, Samsung, Hilton, from different industries. And these people tell us when they hire outside talent, what are the things that they look for? What are the skills that they look for? Now you're designing courses. Can you tell me what is the most common skill that they look for while hiring a candidate? Any guesses? I was surprised when I got to know. And we created this independent survey. We gave a chart to Boeing, we gave a chart to Amazon, MasterCard, Amazon, Google, and told them, tell us one subject area of interest that you always look for. Soft skills. That topped the chart. We couldn't have imagined it. Soft skills. All of them will look for soft skills. So universities, if they are not able to teach it, they can inculcate soft skills. Second thing was, I thought it will be artificial intelligence or machine learning. It was Excel. Doesn't matter what level you are at. Excel. And then comes the futuristic technologies. Yes. Yes, please. I'm sorry, you need to be a bit louder. Uh, my concern is about credential of the participants or the attendees of the course. So I'm wondering what kind of the scheme that they actually have. Like you were mentioning about um, the, the skill courses that they're actually providing for the Singaporean. Yeah. Like in terms of those and the courses that provided online that can be transferred for, for the credits. So how, what is the policy of, you know, like manage these credentials? Okay. So we have 2,600 plus courses. 
out of 2600 plus courses only 50 courses are credit backed which means you will get credits only for 50 courses because universities they want to make sure that if they are giving their university credits there is some degree of control so as i said for all of those courses there is an element of proctored exam so if you're taking a course for which a university is going to give you a credit they will add a layer of proctored exam and assessment which is monitored by machine so if i'm taking this exam i will have to pick up a time slot when i'm taking that time when i'm taking that exam the camera will own turn on the camera will check am i using google am i talking to my friend in the background am i speaking with anyone if i do any of these things a red flag will go and then the entire video will be recorded encrypted compressed and gets manually checked if there are a lot of replays they will get to know amit was cheating they will throw me out so that's how the system maintains the learner's integrity for every edx course when the learner has to register they will have to verify their identity they will have to sit in front of webcam for the first time hold their government issued photo id card the system captures it then they are able to make sure that amit is the one who's taking the exam another thing that i would want to add is when we talk about moocs or any online course a question comes up about recognition so recognition of these courses is very important and there are two kinds of recognition one is academic and second is professional academic recognition i just told you universities give away their credits professional recognitions all the top corporates of the world are using edx to upskill their people microsoft ibm ge accenture ais thailand we're trying to have more and more corporates taking edx courses that's one of the reason why i'm here these corporates cannot send their learners to campuses they have to offer them in demand on demand learning so they partner with us to train their workforce on in demand skills and technologies so when an outsider or a campus student goes to these companies applies for a job and say i already have an edx certificate they get certain preferences because the company is already paying edx to teach their people some companies have gone to an extent like ge says if a learner completes certain courses on edx they will give them a guaranteed interview opportunity so that is the professional recognition that we are getting from moocs and these features are what that that differentiates moocs 1 to moocs 2.0 this is the era for MOOCs 2.0. MOOCs 1 was just accessibility. MOOCs 2 is about learner's integrity. It is about interaction. It is about recognition. These things are there. Yes, ma'am, you had a question? So, uh, right. So it is completely up to you. For example, as I said, what is the price of an edX course? Very expensive, zero, right? If you just have to learn, don't pay anything. For certificates, you will have to pay. So you can decide what certification, certifications you want to offer. Some universities, like the Pakistan one, what they're doing is they're taking an entire micro masters. They're taking a micro masters in artificial intelligence from Columbia University. What is the, and the micro master cost about thousand dollars. They are buying that in bulk. So they get bulk purchase discounts from the university. When the learner completes that micro masters, they're able to apply to Columbia University for their masters of science degree. And if they are accepted, their tuition fee gets reduced by 25%, which is a huge cost saving. So that's the thing with MicroMasters. But a very small number of people will actually go and convert that into online. So what universities can do, they can either include the paid courses, or some universities can just use that as a reference material. For example, if you are a MOOC platform or a university, you are teaching data science, you can teach R or regression analysis and tell a learner, this is a free course from edX. Here is the link, click on it, complete week one, two, three, four. Don't pay for the certificate. I will conduct my own exam. If you pass it, I will give you my own certificate. 
so you can use edX as a re resource learning resource as a book that you can borrow multiple ways in which you can do it but learners will have different motivation if they're getting a certificate so what we have seen is if someone is just and this is the main problem with MOOCs completion rates right completion rate for most of the MOOCs are single digit 7% 5% 9% what we have seen is if a learner has some skin in the game even if they are paying $20 or $40 for a MOOC for a certificate the completion rates are 80 to 90% so that's where it flags off yes Okay, uh, I think uh, we, we will have time after, after another session, we will op open up a few questions and answer after this. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Amit. Thank you so much. <coughs> so let me uh, skip to another session about tai Taiwan MOOC uh, presentation. So could you please? Yeah. <coughs> Hello, everybody. In order to uh, let the co discussion go smoothly, uh, our team, Professor Huang, come out some collaboration idea about the MOOC course. And then uh, Professor She will come out some platform collaboration idea. And then uh, Professor Wang and I will make a brief introduction to OER and uh, uh, e-learning accreditation in Taiwan because we just want to provide some background information because people, you can, don't understand too much about Taiwan's situation. So uh, we have different job, <laughs> make a different, uh, a brief introduction or come up with some idea. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Very nervous. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to thank thank the organizers for the this this round table discussion section, and uh, also thanks to the professor Liu, Liu Jianyan's assistance. Uh, because my English is very, very poor, <laughs> so today I I want to introduction some about our Chinese Open Education Consortium. Last year, on August 22, we first time came to the Thailand to make a non-formal visit. And uh, that time, we preliminary understood the units for the e-learning in Thailand. And uh, we took a, uh, we go to the Suk Thai Open University. Okay, <laughs> Open University in the morning, and we take a group photo. And uh, at the afternoon, we go to the Jura Longong University and uh, have some discussion with the Tipani and uh, Anucha and uh, uh, Michael. And we got some, result, some results about the 
Kurt's exchange about platform technology and uh, some research. And we also set up a line community named TT Moocs. <laughs> And uh, at at that at that time, we decided to participate in this com conference today. So we are here. <laughs> and uh, in April 2019, we identified some contact person with the very very units in Thailand uh, about open university and the distance learning. Our con contact person is the Professor Liu Jianlian. And uh, about open education resource, our contact, contact person is the Wang, eh, Wang Hui Juan, Wang Hui Juan. But today, the engine is the Professor Wang Lu Mei. And about the Thai MOOCs and the STOU MOOCs, and the contact person is me. And about the platform technology, is context person is our professor Shirin and Ling. And before this this meeting, we had a preliminary discussion with the Anutra online. And Anutra Anutra proposed four sub things on, online about cross border moves and the platform development, the research and the development and the quality assur assurance of MOOCs and the learning analytics research. So today we, we propose four sub things in Taiwan. Uh, the first uh, topic is MOOCs cooperation and uh, exchange. Uh, this is the introduction for, by me. And, and uh, the Professor Shenian Ling will introduce some cooperation of platform technology. And uh, the professor Wang Lu Mei and uh, introdu introduced some OER development in Taiwan, and uh, the professor Liu Jianlian introduced to learning qu quality assurance and uh, accreditation in Taiwan. Uh, so the first part is is introduced by me, the most co collaborate collaboration and exchange. I'm, gas, I'm very nervous. And uh, in Taiwan, we, we were a uh, project is a global MOOCs promotion program. And uh, we will establish the Taiwan Academy of Audio and the Video Library with the RIT Library. And uh, we invited our school members that are willing to join the international promotion to participate in this pro program. Now we have the four school, Open University and the Ciji University and the National Kaohsiung University and the Zhengzhou University. Now we have the, provide, we, we can provide the first uh, courses of exchange like this. And the three for the National Open University and the two for the Sijin University and the three for the Zhengzhou University and the two courses I, I had introduced to, to you in the last year about the Muxa Mux Level 1 and the, the introduction about the system of Internet of Things. And we proposed some ideas for the cooperation the, with the, uh, on the course exchange. The Case one is the for video production complete courses, we directly add the English subtitle and the press to other platform, something like this. The course in Taiwan and the, add the <laughs> English subtitle put on the Thai MOOCs. And the Thai MOOCs courses add the English version subtitle and put our open EDU. And the case two, is uh, also for the video production completed courses. We direct also add the English subtitle, but place the course on our own platform, but uh, open a special area. 
sounds like this. And I also have an idea, it's called Teaching on MOOCs. And uh, this is for the pre preparing a new video production courses. And we can think about which kind of courses are needed by students in both countries. And uh, we find out the, like, the teacher who can teach in English. So participate in the video production courses. After the courses start, students from both countries will participate in this course at uh, the same time and study together. So if, if this is work, we can do some learning and analytic research about com comparative analysis after our courses exchange and the learning, learning analysis of the two countries after the co-teaching co courses complete. So this is a simple introduction for the <coughs> course exchange. Thanks. So we next next speak is the uh, Professor Shen Ning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Nian Lin Xue, or you can call me Nick. Okay, easy to remember. Uh, okay, uh, that's uh, tomorrow's slide. <coughs> so I jump to the. Okay. Now I will focus on the uh, collaboration. Uh, discussion about the platform technology. Okay. Uh, before that, uh, please allow me to introduce uh, myself again. Uh, I'm, I'm a teacher in Fengjia University uh, at the Department, department of Computer Science. So about uh, four years ago, Professor Liu invited me to join the uh, MOOC project uh, for the uh, te technology issue. Okay, so I uh, built the, the platform and now I'm, I'm in charge uh, everything about the uh, operation of the system uh, to maintain it and uh, to extend some functionality of the platform. Okay, so that's why I'm here. Okay, uh, here I will uh, propose uh, some possibility about the uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, first is the course that is changed uh, from the uh, te technical view and the tool is changed, and the uh, uh, learning data sharing, and the open edit technology is changed. Okay, uh, because uh, our, our uh, platform is based on open edits, uh, like the, the Thai MOOC, okay, so I think that's very easy to, co uh, co uh, to, to exchange the, the content, okay. Okay, uh, there, is, uh, there are two ways to, uh, to do the course exchange. The first one is uh, just to copy the content to uh, the other side, okay? So uh, export and import, it's very easy. The second one is uh, to uh, use the course link. Uh, now we have, uh, we have built an uh, API for our uh, course uh, metadata. And uh, we publish this API to another uh, website in Taiwan. And uh, uh, in this morning, I have uh, heard about the, the uh, API have, uh, built, have been built in Taimook. So, so I think it's uh, very easy for us uh, to do the, the second choice, okay? And, uh, and the, the second possibility is tour is change. Now we have uh, built uh, another uh, data an analytics the system called Dashboard, uh, a little like the inside uh, built by uh, the Open Edits. Uh, let me have a quick quick look uh, to the uh, Dashboard. Uh, I I know the uh, inside is very uh, powerful the system. Uh, to do the uh, learning data analytics, but uh, something uh, is not easy for our teacher to to control everything, uh, especially for the instructor or teachers. So we build uh, this system for uh, administrator to uh, 
uh, is uh, our uh, course manager. Okay, so he can see uh, some sta statistics statistics of our uh, courses and uh, uh, learners' data. I w I, we are not going to the details. Okay, just uh, take a look about uh, these pictures. Okay, so uh, here are some visualization we do in this uh, system. I will, I will, I will introduce the, the system tomorrow, okay? So just a uh, quick look uh, to this system, okay? So for example, here is the student uh, ranking. I can see how many uh, students are taking the course and uh, how many students t uh, get the certificates. Okay, here is the overview table. So we can see uh, the register and uh, the engagement degree. Uh, that's the uh, uh, degree we, we, we define. Okay, and uh, here is the detail uh, course view, uh, some statistic data. For example, the watch more than half the video. Uh, we think it's more meaningful for us, okay to understand the students' engagement. Uh, that's about the questions, about the uh, discussions, and the, the uh, certif uh, certification to the course and the platform. Okay, here, here is the, uh, uh, the, the figure about the uh, student, uh, student dashboard. Okay, okay uh, let me jump back to So <clears throat> I think maybe we can uh, exchange some uh, techniques or uh, the system uh, with the uh, time MOOC. And the second system is the lab, is the lab, uh, as mentioned in this morning by Professor Liu. Uh, it's a, a system that an uh, instructor can uh, develop some interesting laboratory uh, tool and then put them, then can put the laboratory on our system. And uh, when the students operate on the laboratory, the grade we are sent back to the open IDS system, so that uh, teachers can uh, uh, can <coughs> control everything about the students operation on the, the lab. Okay. Uh, this uh, system we develop. Uh, in the past one year. And the, the, uh, the third tool is a very uh, small uh, software uh, which can uh, de identify the personal uh, data from the usage log so that we can publish the, the log as uh, open data so that uh, the, the instructor and the researchers can uh, do some research on the uh, uh, learning data, and uh, etc. Okay, the third possibility about the uh, uh, learning data sharing, uh, maybe we can uh, define and share some uh, course uh, statistics. For example, the register of each course, the average watch time for each video, etc. Uh, moreover, we can. Uh, share the uh, the log data after the the identification of the uh, learning behavior, so that we can uh, explore the common difference between two MOOC platforms and can do uh, more research. Okay, uh, the fourth possibility is open edX technology is changing. Um, in Taiwan, we have built a, a Slack. Uh, Slack, uh, uh, so, so we, we have um, uh, about 10 engineers in this uh, uh, social media, so, and we can discuss some uh, troubles when we are uh, operating this system. Okay, here is my presentation, thank you.
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lu Mei Wang, uh, or you can call me Tammy. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here to give a brief introduction about our Taiwan Open Educational Resources. Uh, as Professor Liu mentioned this morning, uh, we treat the most courses as uh, OER. And uh, as you know, the original we know the Open Educational Resources. So that we mentioned two types of OERs. First is MOOCs courses bulletin ebook. That's we collective our or uh, sponsored by the Minister of Education in Taiwan. We produce about 245 courses, and we collective it as a bulletin. So everyone can choose through the bulletin and uh, access the these courses. Another one is open education resources. That's the. Uh, URL about the, this one. So I will to introduce the two types of OERs to all of you. First of all is the MOOCs, uh, we call the MOOCs, that's a Chinese character. That, uh, she is like the teacher, uh, very tough for teacher. Uh, that's the Chinese character means. So MOOCs course Burton ebook. That's uh, like the, we collect the whole courses, the uh, name, the teacher's names, the university, and the introduction about the course. So that's the, everyone can choose through this one and have the text searching about these courses and get the, which topic or the contents they will be like to take. Uh, that's the, this one like the inside the each courses. Uh, the, and uh, we register each courses have the DOI. So have the permanent IP, so we can to access this one. So that's why we can use like the OERs. And the others we is use the open educational resources. This one we collected several things in this. Uh, that's we can think that uh, we collected about the, the recent years about the books, except and the, the uh, uh, digital and the e-learning achievement about the government. So we collected all things uh, to the different type. The different type including the materials, e-textbooks, open courses, and the project video resources. The first is the materials. That's in more than 15,000 materials that can use in this one. So that's we will use like the create Commons license. This one is one example. That's from the, from the National Palace Museum. Uh, that have many old things, that the pictures, uh, this uh, sculpture, other things. So you can use the CC to license, uh, to use these pictures. Another one is the Taiwan Books OERs. And uh, that's the textbook. So uh, we can to sort by the subject, uh, author, and the subjects that we used mostly. So that's for the uh, users can to search easier to have the, the web. And that's the uh, statistic about the collection monthly. Uh, average about, uh, I think, uh, 250 average that we are collecting these resources. And that's the usage. Uh, the first is Taiwan and the US and the mainland China. So I think that may be used the Chinese that we would like to access these OERs. And that's the pitch, the, the every, uh, every month page reviews, statistics, and so on. Okay, and the first, uh, the, the last thing I want to mention is that uh, for each courses, we will to link to the OERs they use. So that OER will appear like the, this one. That's the uh, open EDU, that's the Taiwan uh, address. So that's it for the students can to access OERs as they use. So that's my brief introduction. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let me make a brief introduction about e-learning quality assurance and accreditation in Taiwan. 
and you know, um, to ensure the quality of e-learning course, and the Ministry of Education in Taiwan has uh, built up the center, uh, e-learning accreditation center since 2006. And it's operated by National Open University, that is our university. So we made a clear standard and certification process to review this uh, e-learning course. And that is, this part is for the regular, regular e-learning course. In another part, now we, since uh, 2017, we provide another uh, evaluation for non-formal education program accreditation center. And that is without um, credit course. But after the uh, assess uh, uh, evaluation process, they can become a credit course. But today I want to show um, the formal course. And in this accreditation, we have three items of accreditation. The first one is e-learning courses. The other one is e-learning teaching material, just the uh, digital teaching material. But it's suspended since 2015. And that the other one is the master program by e-learning. And I want to introduce the accreditation of the e-learning course. Um, the, we develop an indication for course accreditation. I include uh, eight dimension. The first one is course description. The second one is learning motivation keeping. That means the teacher has, has using the instruction design to provide some motivation for the student to engage in this course. And dimension three is interaction of learner and material. And dimension four is interaction of learner and teacher. That means teacher have to make interaction with student in the forum discussion or any kind of social media is, is allowable. And dimension five is interaction between learner. The teacher has to encourage student to uh, interact on, online, uh, synchronized or non-synchronized uh, learning. Dimension six, evaluation. We provide online tests or uh, um, any kind of assessment and with feedback. And that's very important for our student. Dimension seven is service of instructional management. D did they provide questionnaire pre, pre the course or post the course? Uh, they, did they have any kind of support uh, from the university? And dimension A is about the platform they use. And in each dimension, they provide specific indication. And some indication is required, and some indication is option. And so a total of seven, seven thirteen, uh, uh, 77, uh, 37 indication in this eight dimension. And how to pass the accreditation. And this accreditation is for college and university and professor can apply their course uh, to apply for the accreditation process. And we have grading system. And for example, each indication includes three labels, A plus, A, and B. In terms of numeric score, A plus is equivalent to three point, A is equivalent to two point, and B is equivalent to one point. And if you want to achieve, you want to attain the accreditation certification, you, you want to pass the accreditation, all required indications should be at least grade A. That means two point. And each dimension indicators should be at least grade A in average. So if you can do that, get this uh, scored, you can pass this accreditation. If in any require uh, indication if you got a big grade and that would be fair because it's a, re a required indicator. For example, indicator 4.4, uh, that is belong to domain uh, four. And 4.4, the instructor can respond well to learner's question in the discussion forum in time. A plus is within two days. A is within a week, B is more than a week or not respond. 
So in every indicator, we have a clear statement for our reviewer. Now, uh, for each course, we provide four experts to uh, evaluate this course, and two e-learner specialists, two field experts. And we give them two or three weeks to complete the assessment according to this indicator. And then we, we host a meeting to invite this expert come to the uh, office and we help them go through all the indicator and try to reach the consensus. And then we'll know uh, this course will pass the accreditation or fail. The top five fail indicator all related with is interaction. You know, Taiwan people don't like to ask questions online or on, in office. So you can see 4.3, positive um, synchronous interaction between instructor and learner. 5.3, positive synchronous uh, interaction among learner. 5.4, positive synchronous interaction between instructor and learner. So you can see the interaction is not good for most of the e-learning course in Taiwan. 4.7, online assistance service is provided. It, some some uh, professor did not provide online assistance enough. 4.4, the instructor can respond well to learner's question in the discussion forum in time. Okay, sorry. From this statistic, uh, I can tell you, we, since uh, two, 2000, uh, 2006 from uh, until now, 2018, you can see the average pacing rate is about 51. It's about 51. And the university joint accreditation is about maybe uh, 20 to 30 university. And the course, uh, was applied for the accreditation is about um, about 100, 90 to 100 each year. So it it's not formal uh, statistic. It, it is estimated that uh, about a total of about 2,000 e-learning course in all university in Taiwan each year. But I think only five percent. That's that's our estimate. 5% of this course apply for accreditation, and only 2.5% pass the accreditation evaluation. So if a teacher in Taiwan, if they want to obtain the accreditation and want to get approval of the accreditation process, it takes a lot of effort to do these things. But I think it's paid off because um, in some universities, especially in private uh, universities, they provide incentives. They provide incentives. As I know that some teachers tell me, uh, if they can pass the one uh, e-learning course accreditation, each one they can get 50 to 100,000 NT dollars as incentives for some university in Taiwan. But most of the university can reduce teacher lo uh, teaching load teaching load in for the, uh, as an incentive for some university. So I think accreditation standard is not just a standard, but also a good guideline to help teacher conducting a high quality learning course in Taiwan. I think that is a great achievement in Taiwan, and that is our uh, university's MOOCs. Uh, thank you.